Um, it's interesting in that this is recalled um, in the middle of several uh, parables and opportunities. And so we've been walking through this summer a little bit talking about uh, various parables, understanding that these are unique stories that Jesus uses. And not only is there usually just one point, but there's several points uh, whereabout in there. And so we're interested to look at some of those things and how Jesus layers these things for us. And that brings us to the living word opportunity of Scripture because not only do we pull things out and we immediately jump off the page, but as our life continues to show us new experiences and new perspectives, we seem to be able to gather more out of this living word. So today we'll be taking a look starting in uh, chapter 12, verse 35. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Verse 37. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve. Will have them reclined at the table and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Verse 41, Peter asks, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? And Jesus answers, who then is the faithful and wise manager? whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose the master says to himself, I'm sorry, but suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the maid servants and the man servants, and eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him into pieces and assign him to a place with unbelievers. Verse 47. The servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. For everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. My dear friends, the scripture, the message is called Prepare to Ask. We are a people of faith that is active. We are not a people of faith who are called to the recliners of life. Would you agree that because we have the good news in our hearts, because we have been freed from the weight of sin because of the work of Jesus on the cross, we know the good news and the good life. But the good life of faith is not the one this nation would tell us is the good life to live. So it's important that we be ready, as verse 35 says, be ready and dress for service and keep your lamps burning. It's a moment of being prepared. And as a Boy Scout and Eagle Scout myself, if any of you have been or have ever had your children in, you'll know the motto is be prepared. And so this leaps off the page to me because it meant be prepared for the unexpected for this moment, ready before you go out on any type of journey that you will be able to lead and make it safely back. And in this moment, Jesus separates a couple of different accounts for us today. I officiated my very first wedding since moving here yesterday, and it was on beautiful Lake Superior, and I remember thinking to myself and talking with some of the family that they've experienced a couple of rough years, and this was the first time in almost 24 months that they had gathered together, and everybody was smiling with joy. It wasn't around a hospital bed, it wasn't in a funeral home, it wasn't gathered together at a holiday setting when many people couldn't be there. This was a day of joy and anticipation. And so it's appropriate that most of us have been at weddings before, that it says we are to wait, men waiting for their master to return from a wedding. 
wedding banquet. So when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. And I think to myself, there was great joy returning from the wedding banquet. They served barbecue. Right? I mean, that's enough, but the people who met each other and struggled along in this world and want to solidify their life together as two became one, and they wanted to make the Lord the center of that, the cornerstone. There was a lot of joy and celebration in that moment. So, of course, naturally, it allowed me to think of, of my marriage and the great day that, that we exchanged vows and rings, and it was this moment where, I don't want to say I skipped home, but there was, there was a joy in arriving home. Right? We were full of the joy of celebrating and everyone was in high spirits. There was good food and drink and merrymaking and glory. This is the image that Jesus gives when we have to be ready for service as Christians and keep our land learning to be prepared to be ever watchful. So we would have that same type of joy and anticipation of coming home, right? We would have a joy in serving the resurrected Lord. But then Jesus says, but that's not everyone. Jesus said it would be good for those who serve in that way, but then there will become another scenario in verse 30 and verse 38. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. Because it is not known the hour or day when the Son of Man will be expecting his return. Now here's an interesting illustration for us that I don't want us to miss because there's a lot of master servant talk here. And I don't want us to get distracted. This first scenario that Jesus proposed in the story of being watchful comes from a master joyfully returning. And the servants are waiting, are prepared, right? They see when, when the master comes home, all right? They see when the car is coming up the driveway. And they are ready to open up the door immediately and welcome the master home. Yet Jesus also says, but not everyone will be welcoming the master home. You see, because the homeowner, Jesus' arrival, the master's arrival to them will be both very unwelcome. Because they won't be prepared for that arrival. So when Jesus comes, it won't be with an immediate opening the door, right? It'll be closing the blinds and shutting the lights off and nobody's home, Jesus, that kind of thing. That Jesus' arrival won't be something that's celebrated with fanfares of joy returning from the wedding banquet. That it will be as a thief in the night, an unwelcome visitor. I know in our hearts, my dear friends, we do not want to be a people who sees the arrival of Christ as an unwelcome thief in our homes. But it's important that we look very closely within our lives to understand that today is a great day of worship. Today we sing songs that are lifting up and speaking truths of God in our lives. But when we leave this place, let us not be the owner of our own homes. The homes that we create in our hearts. Because see the difference that the master owned the home and the servants in his name opened the door joyfully for him because the master Jesus owns the home. We are his servants. He is the ruler of our lives and we freely surrender to his will as we sang earlier. But when Jesus says sort of woe is this other scenario, it doesn't say it's the master's house, it's the homeowner's house. It's mine and my stubborn humanity and my sinful pride that I own this house. And Jesus, you are an unwelcome visitor in my life. That even Jesus, that we read about a couple of weeks ago, that even the demons acknowledged, is the Christ. It doesn't matter that I know that. It matters more than I believe and I change because of that. My dear friends, would we be welcoming the Master and looking forward to that day when Jesus returns. Now I know some of you have probably heard it from people of all different ages and generations because it further goes on to say that because they don't know, there may become a time when a servant becomes so relaxed, so content with the delayed arrival of Jesus' second coming, of the Master coming, that because it's taking so long, he takes to beating up the people around him, those that are serving him, to eat and get drunk. So what happens is we find ourselves in this moment in history because when these words were written nearly 2,000 years ago, there was a sense of urgency. There was a sense of Jesus is coming soon, so be ready. Be prepared. 
right? Live your lives for Christ because it will come at an unexpected moment. But here's this moment where as generation goes, as generation goes, as generation goes, we read this almost 2,000 years later, and there's this opportunity for us to wonder, well, a thousand years ago, didn't they preach the same message to be ready? Here we are a thousand years later and still preaching the same message. Our great-grandparents had heard the same scripture with that urgency. But there's that moment of warning, my dear friends, because time is just different. Jesus is not waylaid at the Mackinac Bridge. He's not delayed by any work of man. There is a time that Jesus will be returning. We need to remember, it doesn't matter how many years. The point is, Jesus calls us not to be lazy in our faith. To not take for granted the grace of Christ. And to allow ourselves to get lazy. And to allow ourselves to get self-centered. To allow us to hurt the world around us. To become, have our witness be tainted by this moment where the good news of Jesus Christ covering our sins and rising from death no longer means anything. I hope it means something today so powerful and new. But I would ask you to think back in those moments. Maybe you were in BDS. And we sang those songs and we started to get it. There is a joy that Jesus is real. And Jesus' love for us is so amazing. Or maybe it comes in a different venue as an adult. Various things. We have camp that's right down the road. Whatever circumstance that brought us literally to the table. And we bowed down and we saw that Jesus, we are not worthy of the sacrifice. And Jesus says, no, you're not. But out of my great love for you, stand anyway and serve me in this world. Service goes beyond our hour in service on Sunday. Or maybe it's Sunday today. We are called to not be the faith that says Jesus loves you and that changes things in the world and you are saved by your many sins. But I'm going to put up the recliner in my response to Christ because Jesus Probably isn't coming back today. We're not a lazy faith. Jesus beaten and broken carried a cross as far as he could. That was not easy. That was not recliner sacrifice. We are not a reclining people. Jesus says, are we waiting in anticipation of living our lives, waiting for Jesus to return? It says, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be given. And here's the question. When we see the many blessings that are upon us, we must be prepared for this question. We must be prepared to give an answer. With the things that we are entrusted with, whether we wish it was more or not, this truth in our lives, in our hearts, the truth that we know and we proclaim, that can set others free. Not by the message from our hearts, but by Jesus' promise behind it. Jesus created promise when He said that I am coming back. Live in this faithfulness. So He's expecting us to respond. If we have this life-changing news in this moment, are we sharing it with the urgency that the Master would come back? Maybe you've said this in the past, or maybe even now. If we're in our recliner, right? Maybe I'll get up one more season. Here. When we find ourselves with those perfect moments and times that pass us by, you know the ones that I could have said this. I should have said this. I should have taken that moment to say this. But it's awfully hard to get out of the recliner in time. And when Jesus arrives on that day, when we come as a thief unwelcome. Because he would look in our eyes and say, why didn't you see that person I put in your path? Why didn't you help them? When you felt the words of witness and testimony on your lips, why didn't you share with them my love for them? You had it within your life. Why didn't you share it? Because you don't know the day and the hour in which I will return you are the one I sent to them in this day and place so that they would hear how much I love them. 
My dear friends, that's a heavy responsibility. We have been entrusted with much life-giving news. We just had prayer requests, right? And I looked up the one for Shar here. If we had the answer, would we keep it to ourselves? If we knew the truth of what the diagnosis could be or how long it would be, if we had all the answers that started with this moment, would we keep it from her? No! But we have something that will give life that leads all to eternity, this truth that does save lives. We have the answer. We know the diagnosis. Why is it different? Why is it different? We have been entrusted with news, the good news. Those who have been entrusted with little, well, more will be demanded of them. The good news we have is not little. But when we pray and desire for more, we have to think of ourselves being good stewards of what we have. Now a lot of times, church, I know when we talk about being good stewards, we're expecting a money message, right? We're expecting the bigger offertory plates to come out, right? I know, there's a bit of panic there. But today I'm talking about something else. And for your devotions, when we're going back through, through chapter 12 here, you will see this pattern of Jesus talking about stewardship of many things. More precious than anything we could possibly have in our bank account. More precious than our favorite outfit. More precious than any possession we have is one thing that will always be limited. And that's time. Jesus is talking about us stewarding our time for the glory of God. My dear friends, I know we have things going on today. And we have a schedule. I do too. Commitments to make. But if we find ourselves not giving God the best of what we have, we find ourselves not serving with an urgency that it could be this afternoon. This could be our last time to gather in this place. This afternoon could be the place and time in all of created history that Jesus comes back. And will He find us waiting with joy? Or will He find us in the recliner? And he will come as an unwanted visitor. Because we're not ready for him to look into our lives and say, yes, Jesus, we love you. And you can see that because of this. I don't ever want anyone to think that I don't take great joy in worship for the songs that we sing. But these songs that we sing have to be a result of something. They can be the start of something, but they are always the result of something. Let these not be empty words that we sing. Let these not be empty words that we say. But let them come from our hearts that we are waiting on Jesus to return. But until He does, we serve with joy. With our clothes ready and our lamps on to serve. And the Holy Spirit tugs at us and says, Yes.